And let's pray together, church family. God, we praise you because Jesus is our living hope. He's crucified on the cross for us and raised from the dead. And God, we praise you that you've invited us to meet with you in this room this morning. And now, God, we're asking for you to meet with us, to speak to us, open our hearts. And God, I know there's some in the room who are facing tremendous challenges and obstacles. And I pray that as a result of our time together, they'll have greater courage, greater faith. Help us not to back down from anything that you put in front of us. God, we love you and we praise you and we receive all these things in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Hey, you can be seated, Family Church. Thanks for being here today. My name is Jimmy Scroggins. I'm one of the pastors here. And every Sunday we have a Bible study and that's what we're going to do right now. So why don't you go ahead and get your Bibles out. Turn your Bibles on. Grab a Bible from the pew in front of you and open up to Numbers chapter 13. We're gonna be looking at Numbers chapter 13 and 14 today. And today's kind of like a prequel because starting next Sunday, we're going through 10 messages going all the way through the book of Joshua. And this message today is going to introduce the character of Joshua to you and give you some background on that. But while you're turning, I just think it's great to be in the house together as a church family. It's a great privilege to be together as a church family. We get to do family stuff. I mean, I'll tell you right now, you see all those interns up here? I mean, there's interns from all over the country. These are young people. I'm talking about from Biola University in California, Liberty University in Virginia, Louisiana Tech University, the University of Alabama, Washington University in St. Louis, University of North Georgia. They're from all over the country. And you might read in the news that young people are walking away from faith in Jesus Christ. But at Family Church, we have a bunch of young people who are walking right towards Jesus. Christ. And you should celebrate that and you should be proud of that. And we get to invest in them this summer. What a privilege. And then we get to celebrate all those baptisms. I hope you never get tired of watching those baptisms on video. I mean, those are people who are taking significant steps, taking courageous steps. Those are people who've decided I'm not going to back down. I'm going to go forward with what God wants me to do. And they get baptized. And we also have, uh, every week we have funny baptism things that happen on the video. You see the one lady, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like her head didn't go under and her feet didn't go under. We just baptized her butt. That's all we, that's all we did. And, uh, and yet, she's taking a step forward for Jesus. Praise God. God knows what the symbolism all is. This is what happens at a, at a family. It's regular stuff. And I hope you feel that. If this is your first time to family church, I hope you'll understand that this is a room full of love. It's a room full of grace. It's a room full of forgiveness. And it's a room full of faith. And that's the kind of room that I want to be in every Sunday. I hope it is for you, too. So, As we're getting ready to do this, uh, this is Memorial Day weekend. I want to always be cognizant that the reason we can gather in freedom is because some people over centuries now have paid the ultimate price for us. You understand that, right? That our freedom is not free. That people have died so that we could be free. People are dying right now so that we could be free. They, They purchased it for us. There are people all over the world serving so we can stay free. Uh, Just this week, so some of you guys know my son is an infantry officer with the United States Army, and he's been over in Eastern Europe, um, over there right on the Russian border for the last 10 months, but this week he got to come home. And so we're so thankful to have our son uh, back with his family in Savannah, Georgia. It's really sweet because Riley, our daughter-in-law, this this one right here is is, uh, Wyatt, the little one there on your right, and uh, when James left, Wyatt was just a couple of months old, and he couldn't even walk or anything so he comes back and now Wyatt can walk and uh, she made a sign for him and he had his footprints on it it said first time ever walking to my daddy I, I know I'm sorry just gets to me a little bit but we all do family church stuff and I want to share that with you but this is what um this is this is what we do now my purpose this morning is I want you to know that God does not want you to back down that is my main point God does not want you to back down The whole world is trying to push you around. The whole world is trying to keep you from believing what you should believe and doing what you should do. The whole world is trying to get you to undermine God's uh, word. The whole world is trying to get you to back away from your faith. Don't do it. If you're a Christian, you should not back down because Jesus is crucified on the cross for you. Jesus is raised from the dead. No matter what anybody says, Christians should never, ever, ever back down. That's the theme of the message. It's the theme of the whole book of Joshua. In fact, it's so important. Look at your neighbor right now and tell them, don't back down. Yeah, I love that theme. Don't back down. Uh, several years ago, there was a hymn writer. His name was Thomas. 
And Thomas wrote a song about this very theme. Some of you may know it. He said, no, I'll stand my ground. I won't be turned around. And I'll keep this world from dragging me down. Gonna stand my ground. And I won't back down. Hey, baby, there ain't no easy way out. You know what? Hey, I'm gonna stand my ground and I won't back down. Hey, if you don't know that song, you should know it. That's a good song. That's a good song. And if you're a Christian, you should not back down. Why? Because if you're a Christian, that means that God is on your side. If you're a Christian, it means you have a book, the Bible, that tells you how to pursue God's design. You don't need to be intimidated by anything or anyone. Our problems get the best of us when we get our eyes on the problems and off of God. But you shouldn't do that because if you are a Christian, then you are a child of the king of the universe. And he loves you and he knows you and he is on your side. He has forgiven you of all of your sins. He is restoring you from all of your past failures. He loves you. He wants the best for you. He's on your side. God is for you. And because of that, you should never back down. We get ready to read our text from Numbers chapter 13, but I want to give you some background just to remind you of how we get to where we are when we come to Numbers chapter 13. You guys remember the very first page of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God created the and the heavens and the earth. What year was that? We don't know exactly, but we do know that Adam and Eve were the first couple. They had kids who had kids who had kids who had kids. And many years later, this guy named Abraham comes on the scene. And God picks out Abraham as a special person. And God tells Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation out of your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And he said, your, your children are going to be more numerous than the stars in the sky, more numerous than the sand on the beach. And he said, uh, this is what I'm going to do with you. And it was a miracle because when God made him that promise, Abraham and his wife Sarah were too old to have kids. So God gives them a miracle baby. His name is Isaac. Isaac has kids. One of his kids' name is Jacob. Jacob has a bunch of kids. His probably most famous child is named Joseph. And so Abraham lived in about 1996 B.C., and then Joseph and the, the children of Israel end up moving to Egypt in about 1875. They end up living in Egypt for 400 years, where eventually they become slaves to the Pharaoh in Egypt. They are slaves for 400 years. After 400 years, they cry out to God. God does the 10 plagues. You guys have seen the movies about it. God does the Passover, and the children of Israel get to leave Egypt. After they leave Egypt, Pharaoh changes his mind. He tries to chase them down. God walks the children of Israel through the Red Sea in about 1446. They walk, the Red Sea opens up. Children of Israel walk through the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army tries to chase them. The Red Sea collapses on them, drowns Pharaoh and his army. They spend the next two years making their way through the desert until they get to this place called Kadesh Barnea. Now, one of the things that God promised Abraham way back here in 1996, he promised Abraham, you can read about it in Genesis chapter 12. He says, Abraham, I'm gonna make you a great nation, but I'm going to give you a land. He said, I'm going to give you the land. It's called the land of Canaan. This is a land flowing with milk and honey. In other words, it's a very prosperous and blessed land. And I'm going to give this land to your descendants one day. So Abraham would tell his kids, Isaac, and his grandson, Jacob, and his great-grandson, uh, 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 Joseph, hey, guys, one day God's going to take us into the promised land. For generations, 400 years in Egypt, even though we're slaves right now, one day God is going to take us into the promised land. After they walk through the Red Sea, why did God deliver us like that? Because God is taking us to the promised land. And finally, they get to this place called Kadesh Barnea. Kadesh Barnea is a real place. I think I've got a map. I can show it to you right here. It's right there on the Sinai Peninsula. It's what it would be on the modern-day border of, of Israel and Egypt. They get to Kadesh Barnea. They're on the border of the land of Canaan, the border of the promised land. They've been hearing about this for hundreds of years, and now they're about to go in. Problem is, in Canaan, there's some people already living there. And if you want to take the promised land, God's going to let you do it, but you're going to have to go in and take it from the people who are already there. So that's where we pick up the story in Numbers chapter 13, starting in verse 1. This is what the Word of God says. 
the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a chief among them. Let me pause here and make a few observations. First of all, notice the promise of God. God says right there in Numbers chapter 13, verse 1, I am giving this land to the children of Israel. That is a promise from God. That is God's word to the people of Israel. I am giving you this land. So this promise that he's giving them a homeland, Canaan, the promised land, has been well established in their minds and hearts over many generations. Only until now, it was almost like a legend that your parents or grandparents tell you, oh, now it's getting real because they are on the border and it's time to go in and spy out the land. And the spies did go in. Skip down to verse 23, Numbers chapter 13. And they, that's the spies, came to the valley of Eskel and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it on a pole between two of them, and they also brought some pomegranates and figs. Let's pause there, because it's kind of a weird thing. You're about to have this big war with all these people in Canaan, so you send in the spies. The spies go in. They cover about 250 square miles. They're in there for about 40 days, and when they come out, what do they do? They stole some fruit, and so they come out with the stolen fruit, but the fruit is not just any fruit. So, guys, I love grapes. Anybody else like grapes out here? I love to eat grapes, but I buy my grapes at Publix. The grapes I buy at Publix come in a little cellophane wrapped container. I can hold it in my hand. They're not like the grapes from the Valley of Eskel. These grapes were so big that the two men had to carry a bunch of grapes on a pole. This was mythical. This was unbelievable. This was a symbol of the great prosperity that God had promised the children of Israel when they got to the promised land. And it's such a powerful symbol. Have anybody out here ever been to Israel? You guys ever been to, some of you guys have been, I've been. If you go to Israel, the logo for the Israeli Ministry of Tourism today is, guess what? It's two guys carrying a cluster of grapes on a pole. Because it's such a powerful symbol of the blessing of God and the prosperity of God. Skip down to verse uh, Oh, so, 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 so they have this big assembly, the spies come back, they've got all their stolen fruit, and they're about to give this big report to Moses and to all the children of Israel, and they're going to do it in public. That's where we pick up in verse 27. And they told him, the spies talking to Moses, we came to the land to which you sent us, it flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. So what you have here is you have 12 spies went into the land. Ten of them gave a bad report. And two of them, Caleb, who just spoke, and Joshua, who we'll read about in a minute, are the two spies who gave the good report. Ten spies said, we cannot go in there. But Caleb says, we can go in there. Because Caleb trusts God. Caleb believes God. Caleb's heard the promises of God. Caleb's tired of waiting. Caleb does not want to back down, but the other spies, the 10 spies, they won't have it. They're insistent on giving this discouraging bad report and they discourage the people of God and the people of God begin to doubt God's promises and the negative people win the day. You ever been in an environment where you felt like God wanted you to move forward but there was just these negative voices speaking and people saying that you can't do it and pointing out all your flaws and failures and all the problems and it's amazing how powerful negative words are. Well, these people are speaking negative words, and they win. 
Flip over to Numbers chapter 14, starting in verse 6. When they decided not to go into the promised land, here's what happened. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, the land which we passed through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. But the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the people of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? And how long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? I think you can see that God takes it really seriously when people doubt his word. I mean, praise God for people like Caleb and Joshua. Caleb says, we can do it. We can do it right now. Let's go do it. Joshua says, we can do it. We can do it right now. Let's go do it. Joshua and Caleb said, those, we're not afraid of those people. Those people are like bread for us. We're going to eat them. They're nothing when God's on our side. They were not wanting to back down. But God takes it seriously when his people know exactly what he wants us to do. And we deliberately defy his word. We deliberately disobey him and choose to go another path. God takes it seriously. When we do that, we put ourselves in danger of the judgment of God. So we better pay attention. And I don't have time to read it all to you. You can read it on your own, Numbers chapter 14. But in Numbers chapter 14, you're going to see what God ultimately decides to do as a consequence to the children of Israel because they decided to listen to the 10 bad spies instead of obeying him and listen to Joshua and Caleb. And here's what happens. Every person 20 years old and older is never going to get to go into the promised land except Joshua and Caleb. Every person 20 years old and older, God says, is going to die in the desert. You're going to wander around the desert for the next 40 years until everybody 20 years and older is dead in the desert. And then we'll come back and revisit this. Strong. If you read the books of Numbers and Deuteronomy, what you're going to find out is there's all these stories about how this entire generation is doomed to live out their days in the desert of Mount Sinai, in the desert of Son, the Sinai Peninsula. And they don't want to go into the land, and God says, fine. You don't want to go in? You're not going to go in. You're never going to go in. So I guess you would see that God's pretty serious about judgment, don't you? But you know what else you see? God is a loving God. God is a redemptive God. God is a restorative God. How so? Because God wants good things for his children. Look, if we purposely disobey him, if we deliberately disobey his promises and disbelieve, disbelieve him, if we insist our, on going our own way, watch out because God doesn't play. But what God also does, the parents in the story get judged for their lack of faith. But if you keep reading, and we're going to read about this, so the next 10 weeks we're going to study the book of Joshua and the book of Joshua is about how the next generation, the children who are 19 and under, by the time they're adults, they do go into the land and they do possess the land because God never gives up on his people and God's never going to give up on you either. And God's never going to give up on your kids either. And God's never going to give up on your grandkids either because God doesn't give up on his people. So what are we going to learn from all this? If you want to take some notes, four things I'd like you to write down. i got to fill in the blank for you right here on this program. I'd encourage you to get in the habit of writing things down when we have a Bible study. So here's four things. Number one, I'd like you to write down, don't listen to the wrong people. Don't listen to the wrong people. The children of Israel had good spies and bad spies, two different ways to go. They listened to the wrong people. Why were the bad spies saying what they were saying? Because the bad spies went into the land. And they saw real obstacles. The bad spies were not telling lies. They really saw what was really there. Big people, a big land, big cities, big walls. The challenges were real. It's not wrong to acknowledge when you have real obstacles in front of you. I told you a few weeks ago, I cannot stand to be around Christians who never acknowledge bad things. 
I don't like being around Christians who are always like, oh, it's all good, praise the Lord, God's got this. Yeah, God's got this, but it's still life. Hurt still hurts. Sad is still sad. Hard is still, I mean, it's difficult. So, so I don't like to be around Christians who fail to acknowledge real difficulties, real challenges. Look, if you've got a kid with a learning disability, that's real stuff. Your past struggles, that's real. That divorce, that funeral you had to go to, your cancer diagnosis, your loved one who's in hospice, your prodigal daughter, all of that is real. And it feels like a lot sometimes. And sometimes the way life works, you're gonna feel like you cannot possibly bear another thing. And then another thing gets piled onto you and it just feels like it's too much and you think you can't deal with it. And if you feel that way, that's probably true because in your own strength, you probably can. Praise God, if you're a Christian, you don't have to carry anything in your own strength. The God of the universe is with you. If you're a Christian, you've received Jesus as your savior. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you. If you're a Christian, you're part of a church family. Your church family is all around you and with you. You can't do it on your own, but you don't have to. Look, it's this week, one of our church members was talking to me and he said, listen, I don't know if I can take another thing. He said, this week my sister called me and she came out as a lesbian and she's gonna marry her girlfriend. My brother told me recently he's deconstructing from the Christian faith and walking away from God. My other brother told me he's leaving his wife and his children for somebody else. He said, I feel like I'm the only one left in my family who's even trying to walk with God and it's really difficult. All the bad spies wanted to talk about was the limitations and the challenges and the weaknesses and the potential for failure. If you read Numbers chapter 13, which we read out loud, you hear what they're saying. We're too small, they're too big. We're too weak, they're too strong. We're like grasshoppers, they're like giants. Always comparing negative, not believing. Well, the wrong people are always gonna help you point out your personal limitations too. And maybe it's not other people, it's the voices in your own head that are gonna tell you why you can't do and you shouldn't do what God has clearly instructed you to do in his word. Somebody might have told you, you're not attractive enough or it's because you're divorced, you can't do it. You're too old, you're too young, you're single, you're in recovery. You haven't been a Christian long enough. You have a struggle with pornography or a substance abuse or whatever it is. You're just not able to do what God wants you to do. You're not able to function like a regular Christian. That's what the bad spies did. They said they, the people in Canaan, are stronger than we. But God never asked them to be stronger than the Canaanites because God is stronger than the Canaanites. And God's not asking you to be stronger than the challenges in front of you because God is already stronger than the challenges in front of you. God asked them to spy out the land. God showed them the grapes And they wanted to focus on the giants. Are you focusing on your problems? Are you obsessing about your weaknesses and your past failures? You don't have to look at yourself because you are limited. You are limited. But God is not limited. So you shouldn't be looking at yourself when you face challenges. You should be looking at God. God's got this. Don't listen to the wrong people and don't back down. Number two on your notes, don't doubt God's word. Do not doubt God's word. God told them, go take the land. I'm giving it to you. But the bad spies gave this bad report and the children of Israel doubted God's word and then they just chose to disobey God. That was a bad decision. If you're gonna be a Christian, you have to believe God and believe God's word and obey God's word. Being a Christian means you figure out what God's word says and then you do it even if it's countercultural, even if it's difficult, even if it requires you to change, even if it requires you to do something that you don't really prefer to do, when God tells you to do something in his word, you should do it. When we choose fear over faith, we're always gonna end up in disobedience. When we knowingly disobey God, even if we come up with our reasons why we're justified to disobey God, we're gonna miss the blessing and we're gonna get the judgment. You might say, well, that's too harsh. I mean, Jimmy, What kind of Bible is this? What kind of God is this who makes people die in the desert just because they made one like really bad decision? Actually, God is giving them what they want. They're the ones who said, we don't want to go in there. And God said, okay, you don't have to go in. You can just die out there in the desert. I'm offering you this, but you don't want it. I'll give you what you want. You want the desert? You can have it. God does that to us too. 
God puts choices in front of you to obey every day. Let me tell you something. God gives you some kind of a free will. God gives you this ability to make real choices. You get to make real choices, but you don't get to choose the consequences of your choices. You can make your own choices, but you don't get to choose the consequences of your choices. Typical example I run into every day at family church. So we always teach people, hey, if you're a Christian and you're dating, you should only date other Christians because you should only marry another Christian and you're going to marry somebody that you date. And so you shouldn't be wasting your time dating people who you're not supposed to marry. And guys tell me all the time, oh, you don't know this girl is so special. This guy's different. And I understand they could be great. They really could be great people. But you want to do something that's going to put you in a position to disobey God, to to miss the blessing of God, and God's going to say, okay, I've tried to tell you. If you insist, I'll let you have what you want, but it probably isn't going to work out the way that you hoped. You say, but yeah, but God will forgive me. That's right. God will forgive you. You can always repent of your sins. You can always confess your sins to Christ, and God will forgive you. You can always repent, but you cannot always repair. You can always repent, and God will forgive you, but you cannot always repair the damage that has been done. Somebody's dating somebody, and you really love them, and you say, yeah, we're really in love. We're just going to start sleeping together. I know technically God doesn't want us to do that, but you know, we're human. Even though you know God's word says that sexual expression is for marriage, but you insist, and you want what you want. God gives you the opportunity to do that. You can have what you want. But the guilt and the shame and the consequences that go with those decisions, you can choose. You get to make choices, but you don't get to choose the consequences of your choices. And don't forget, God's word and God's design are all expressions of God's love for you and the fact that God wants good things for you. When God told them to go into the land, that was an expression of God's love for them. That was an expression of that God wanted good things for them, but they rejected God. When you focus on obeying God, you get the blessings and God will grow your faith. When you willfully disobey God, you lose out on the blessings and your faith comes to a standstill. So you should not doubt God's word. Number three, don't forget God's track record. Do not forget God's track record. Remember what God said in uh, chapter 14, verse 11? Because God was really mad because the people decided they were going to, remember they are going to stone Caleb and Joshua because they kept giving the good report and God actually had to intervene like miraculously and protect them from being stoned. And then God says, how long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them. Now think about the timeline, guys. These people at Kadesh two years ago were living in Egypt as slaves. They were there when God sent the frogs and the flies and turned the water to blood. And they were there when everybody lost their firstborn in the land of Egypt. They were there for the Passover. They were there when they walked across on the dry land. And then they looked back and saw the sea close up over Pharaoh and his army. They saw it with their own eyes. They were there. And then they get to Kadesh, and they're about to go into the promised land. And after all the plagues and the Passover and the Red Sea, they go, we can't go in there. God may not be with us. And I bet God's up in heaven going, are you kidding me right now? After all these signs, now you want to put on the brakes? I wonder if God would ask us the same question. We refuse to obey him, the God who created the world. He, he gave us all these Bible stories for our example. He sent Jesus to save us when Jesus was crucified on the cross and raised from the dead. He loved us when we didn't deserve it and didn't even want him. He created us and gave us life. He gave us our families. He gave us our possessions. He gave us our relationships. He gave us our talents and abilities. He gave us a church family. He gave us Jesus, and we were invited to know God by receiving Jesus by faith. And after all that, we're still going to listen to the wrong people, really? After all that, we're still going to doubt God's word. After all that, we're going to forget God's track record. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't back down because God loves you and God is for you. And he's proven that. Just read the Bible. Look in your own life. Talk to people in the room. Don't doubt God's track record. Last point, number four, don't back down. Like, I think you said that somewhere today. That's right. Don't back down. Don't back down. 
Don't back down. This whole world is going to try to get you to back off of your Christian faith. This whole world is going to try to undermine what you believe and make you feel like you can't even voice it out loud. This whole world is going to make you feel like you're anachronistic, like you're out of step, like you don't know what you're doing, and the Word of God is still true, and the promises of God are still real, and God's track record is still there for you to read about and experience every day. Don't back down. And here's the good news. You may think, well, this is kind of a bad Bible study because, man, all those people dying in the desert, whew, it's harsh. The good news is this. The children got to go in. The children got to go in. Forty years later, the children are grown. They got to take the land. The children got to eat the grapes. The children learned from the failures of their parents. The children learned to focus on God's promises, and they learned that God is indeed a giant killer. And Joshua and Caleb were the only two people over the age of 19 who got to go in. Even though they were old men by then, they still fought for it, and they still believed God, and they still got it. They got to see the promises of God come true with their own eyes. But you know, the greatest promise of God wasn't the land. The greatest promise of God that God gave Abraham was that one day from Abraham's family, God would raise up a leader and a rescuer, not just for the Jewish people, but for all people. And hundreds of years after this episode at Kadesh, God sent his son Jesus, who was a Jewish man from this family. And Jesus, the Jewish man, loves us. And Jesus overcomes every obstacle, and he defeats every enemy. And Jesus takes our sins upon himself on the cross, and Jesus is raised from the dead. And now every person who's out there in the wilderness of sin and despair and brokenness and death can be brought in to the promised land of God if they'll receive Jesus by faith. And that means that you can have the promises of God if you will receive Jesus by faith. You can line your life up with God's design. You can make courageous decisions that other people will not make because you believe in the God who loves you and saves you and wants good things for you. You should not back down. And I'm so glad that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he didn't listen to those other voices who were telling him, save yourself, come down off the cross. I'm so glad that Jesus believed the promises of God. I'm so glad that Jesus remembered his father's track record. I'm so glad that Jesus did not back down when he was hanging on the cross, dying for my sins and for your sins. So what it really comes down to, look, some of you are in a position right now where you know exactly what I'm talking about. God is calling you to do something. God is asking you to do something. There's some decision that you have to make right now. There's some issue that you're grappling with right now and you have been grappling with it and grappling with it and grappling with it and you're here this morning because God is saying to you, don't back down. God, God is saying to you, step up. Stir up some Holy Spirit courage. Remember Christ on the cross and don't back down. And some of you, you've disengaged from God. You're here this morning, but you've kind of disengaged. You're not pursuing your faith. You're not obeying God. Come back. Turn from your sins. Turn back to Christ. Don't back down. And you can do it. Because God loves you. And God's for you. And if you've not received Jesus for yourself by faith, you should do it. If you've not been baptized, you should do it. If you've not become part of a neighborhood church, you should do it. Why? Because you want to be obedient to God and get the blessings. You don't want to be disobedient to God and get the judgment. And if you're a believer in Jesus, you don't back down. To remind us of what Christ has done for us, to save us, to give us the ability to move forward in life, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. We do it every Sunday. We're going to do it right now. The Lord's Supper is a way that Jesus gave us to remind us of his great love for us. We eat the bread, which represents the broken body of Christ. We drink the cup, which represents the shed blood of Christ, which is shed to take away our sins. The Lord's Supper is for Christians who receive Jesus by faith for themselves. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, I don't recommend that you eat and drink the Lord's Supper. I recommend that you sing the songs, pray if you want, lean in. But why don't you wait until after you become a Christian for yourself? And then you can take the Lord's Supper with integrity. 
At Family Church, we believe and we teach that it's best for you to take the Lord's Supper after you've been baptized and after you become a part of a neighborhood church. Now, for some of you, this is your first time here. Never been here before. You're, you're a Christian, but this isn't your church. Okay. If you're a Christian and you would take the Lord's Supper at your church, then take it with us today as part of the extended family of Jesus that goes around the world. But right now, let's confess our sins to the Lord. Right now, let's lean into Christ. Right now, let's remember Jesus and what he's done to purchase our forgiveness. Maybe there's something you ought to tell God right now as we're praying. Tell God, I I will not back down. God, I will move forward. God, I will be obedient to you in this area. Hey, whatever it is, let's pray on our own to the Lord. We'll sing a little bit, and then in just a minute, we'll all eat and drink the Lord's Supper together.